Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Everyone, please join me in rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So we're going to start tonight's meeting with communication from parents, staff, and district residents. Uh, my usual speech up there, I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, the board welcomes comments from the public during their regular business meetings. 30 minutes is reserved during their working meeting for the board to listen to comments, input, and information. In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the board is not allowed to discuss items that are not on the meeting agenda. As appropriate, the board will direct the superintendent to follow up on any items shared during public comment. Please note, it is, it is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting. The board does not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff members at board meetings. However, you can email the board with any such comments. Okay, so our first speaker tonight will be Linda Stevenson. Thank you. I'm Linda Stevenson. Um, I'm a KSD math team coach. I'm a Washington State uh, math competition organizer. Mr. Galbraith, uh, it was so great to see you a few weeks ago at our in-person event in Richland. Ms. Sunvik, thank you for attending one of our online competitions. I'm here to encourage KSD to take advantage of these academic opportunities for their students to inform your principals, your teachers, your parents, your students, that these math competitions exist. Any school can set up a math team and participate in these exciting events. Uh, my organization, Math is Cool, we run statewide math competitions in Washington for fourth through 12th graders. We have thousands of students participate every year. In middle and high school, you have math counts, you have math Olympiad, you have WSMC. And in fact, a week from this Saturday, we're taking the Kamiakin math team to Central Washington University to participate in the state level WSMC competition, which they qualified for earlier this year. We need more KSD teachers running math teams. Um, like at Kamiakin, we have Jenny Bird and Alyssa Adler but there are only a handful of KSD schools that even have math teams right now. And most of them are run by us, which is not sustainable. It's critical to get kids involved at the elementary school level. I think there should be a stipend, something to encourage elementary teachers to be willing to take this on. When you get some teachers or parents that are interested in starting a team at their school, I can set up and run a training session for them. I can teach them how to run a math team. You have my email, so let me know if you have any questions or if you want me to set up a training session, I am more than happy to help. Thank you for your time. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker tonight is Genevieve Parker. Hello, uh, my name is Genevieve Parker. I'm a junior at Kamaikin High School. I've been a part of the math team for the past seven years, and I've helped coach the Amon Creek elementary team for the past three years. And it is honestly so fun coaching them. Um, they recently won first place in our most recent competition. And me and my co-coach, I don't think we've ever been more proud of our own competition. Like we were so excited for them. It was such an awesome opportunity. Um, so math club is, such a great uh, opportunity and I've learned so much from it and I've learned so much from Mrs. Stevenson. Um, we learn about concepts that are taught that we, we learn about concepts that aren't really taught in class and it helps you know teach um, things from a different perspective. Um, the tests in uh, the math club tests are not designed for you to get 100%. In fact getting half of them right is considered above average. Um, this has helped me um, be able to deal with reducing my fear of failure um, which is a really helpful skill. Um, 
when it comes to the actual competitions, they're super fun and I love being a part of that team. Um, um, I remember after our first practice back, when Eamon just won our first practice back on a Monday, all the kids were like, when's our next competition? How do we sign up? We're so ready to do it again. Like everyone has a lot of fun at these competitions. Um, it's been a really amazing experience. I've learned a lot, um, both for math and life lessons. And I would really love if, um, my wish is that KSD can share this with more kids so they can all have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Brendan Dunlap. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brennan Dunlap. I'm a junior at Kamaikan High School, and I've been competing in math competitions for the past eight years. Attending math club has absolutely helped me in the classroom. Practice makes perfect even for math, and math club has provided a lot of practice for me. Each meeting confronted me with dozens of questions, and they all related to the fractions and operations that we were using in the classroom, but they were different. They felt more real. They didn't shy away from complex problems. In class, math was about memorizing. It was about increasingly difficult concepts. But at the club, I was finding simple math in problems that at first seemed complex, but I could later discover the solution to. The club was refreshing in this sense, and it made me excited about math. But the best part of math club was the community. For most math competitions, you are competing as a team. Math was always a very private activity in the classroom, but at the competitions, I learned how to work with many people to solve a problem that together, we, to solve a problem together that would have been too difficult to solve alone. And everyone I met at these competitions had learned to love math like me. And for the past three years, I have been a math club coach at Cottonwood Elementary School. I know firsthand how important math club is and I'm incredibly thankful to Mrs. Stevenson and all of the coaches who have mentored me so that I can now offer this amazing opportunity to more children. I hope that soon the opportunity can be extended to even more students in the Kennewick School District. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Jackson. Okay, I'm gonna screw up the last name here. Topons. Perfect. Jackson Topons will be our next speaker. My name is Jackson Topons, and I am on the fifth grade math team at Amon Creek Elementary. Math club was one of my favorite things to do during the week. I enjoyed learning new skills and working as a team. I started math club when schools were online because of COVID, and it gave me something to look forward to. We just had our first in-person competition, and it was awesome. I love being around other kids that love math and using our new skills. I am proud that our math team won first place in the math and school competition. I hope that there will be a math club in the middle school. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you. That's right. I'm going I'm to deviate here a little bit and say that Jackson gave a very good speech and thank you very much. That was very well done. Okay, our next speaker is Tamara Parker. <laughs> You're on there. <laughs> you signed up. <laughs> um, I have nothing prepared because I didn't mean to sign up, but I'm so glad because as I was hearing this, I wanted to speak because both of my daughter Genevieve and then my daughter Lila have been in math and math and school since my daughter Lila was in third grade, and it has made a huge difference in their life, like huge. They just they love education. They love challenges they're not scared of not understanding math they both tutor math now my daughter's 14 and she has her own like clients her who come to her and pay her she has the skill right and she loves it and she's good at it and and Lyle and Genevieve teaches for a grant at um, Kamayakin after school in the library anyone can come to her and she has students who come to her for math help and so I also want to tell you that um, you should take advantage of Linda Stevenson's offer because she has driven this. Like my kid's success is because of her. She has a passion, she's very capable and her ability to spread that is just like a gift. 
it's a gift. It should really be. I would, as a mother, I would just hope that you guys would take advantage of her offer to, to take her up on all her she can give. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sensing a theme here in math. <laughs> so I mean, I would love to have more of a discussion of, with with. I would love for you guys to reach out. Reach out. Yeah. So I will ask Dr. Pierce here to look at this and see what we can possibly do. This is. Uh, getting Mrs. Stevenson's emails. They were all caps and very excited. <laughs> you know, it was a very, sorry, sorry. It's, 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 why? It was great. Too many caps. <laughs> but it wasn't angry caps. <laughs> I get some of those too. <laughs> no, it was all good. So if we could look at that, that would be great. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, our last speaker will be Tina Gregory. Hi, thank you. CDC, NIH, and Liar Fauci are warning us that they need to lock us down again. Fear being pushed, we will not comply. The PCR test was removed December 31st. It's inaccurate. This synthetic virus created in a lab. Uh, oh boy, I lost it. This synthetic virus created in a lab can be treated. Many doctors, scientists, and lawyers have come out proving the numbers of deaths was a big lie. This pandemic was a hoax. Are you ready to stand against lockdowns, forced masks, and unlawful so-called vaccinations? You sent the levy out again, and at this point, are we confident that you will stand for our children? Science has proven that this is an airborne virus and a mass will never stop it. Our natural immunity is better than these so-called vaccinations. I personally know four people that are suffering severe side effects of these poisonous shots. We the people are in charge, CDC, presidents, and our governors are not lawmakers. It's time our constitution is taught in our schools again. BLM, LGBTQ, and Planned Parenthood don't belong in our schools. Please step up and clean our li libraries out and textbooks from immoral indoctrinations. Change is needed. I'm reminded by our Lord, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with us. Sex outside of marriage is sin. Homosexuality and adultery are sin. Drugs and alcohol are sin. Rejecting God is sin. Sin separates us from God. God loves the sinner yet hates the sin. He made him who knew no sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We need to come alongside in love, yet state things that are evil. The enemy who comes to divide, destroy, and steal. Love conquers a multitude of sin. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sin. I'm here in love for our community, knowing that we can no longer sit by idle and watch these lockdowns and immoral teachings be pushed on our innocent children. And I saw a thing today that our uh, so-called administration is changing the definition of sex, and he is going to be forcing it on our schools, and our schools will learn they will lose their funding if they don't teach this new sexual thing. And I'd like you to investigate that because the line needs to be drawn. But thank you all. You all are doing a great job and we appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, that is the end of our speakers this evening. Okay, next on our agenda, consent items. I move to approve the Consent items as written. Okay, I have a motion to approve. I have a second. Second. Approved and seconded. Any questions, comments? I actually have a question about them. And it's actually more of a general question. Um, if, for example, we didn't want to discuss a consent item, I mean, like, for example, like there's a book, right? Which I, I looked it up and it seems fine, but like, if that did happen and I wanted to discuss it, how, when would that, would that would happen like right now? Was that when that would happen? We would usually pull it beforehand, wouldn't we? Correct. So in that um, kind of enhanced agenda that, that the board receives, typically what would happen is if a, if you wanted something pulled from consent, you would let the board president and Ahead I of know, time. and okay. then it could be um, pulled and put into the body of the agenda for discussion. Got it. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? I'll call for the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunbeck? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. 
Okay, next on our agenda, superintendent and board member reports. Up here. Hey, well, thank you. I've got a couple uh, brief things to share tonight. One is I wanted to share that just this afternoon, uh, superintendents received an email from State Superintendent Chris Reichdahl. And uh, the email is sharing that earlier this afternoon, the State Board of Health voted not to require Washington students to be vaccinated against COVID-19 for school attendance next fall. So uh, there um, is some more information, just background information about the technical advisory group that was convened and so forth, and the board's aware of all that. Um, but I wanted you to know, um, obviously the board recalls passing the resolution that was sent along to the technical advisory group. And um, so the outcome is that uh, COVID-19 vaccine will not be added to the required vaccinations for students. There has been no change to staff vaccination employees, um, you know, and um, so that's been in place since last October um, was the deadline for that. So at this point in time, there's been no change on that front, but we know with certainty that students won't be required to receive the vaccine. The other thing that I wanted to uh, just remind everybody about is we've got one more levy open house this week. We had one prior to spring break. We had one last night. It's been great that we've had uh, board members attend. We haven't had a ton of community members attend, but um, we've had a handful. And so it's been a great opportunity to just uh, give the levy presentation, answer their specific questions, uh, just connect with community members um, who want to talk about what's on the levy and, and learn more about the levy. So there's one more tomorrow night, 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, the format is essentially people come and there's handouts and uh, we're here, staff is here, gives an opportunity for us to just, you know, say hello and answer any questions people have. And then the presentation starts at 6.15 and then there's questions and answers following the presentation. So. Uh, one one more <laughs> open house. Uh, it, they've been helpful in that feedback we've received has helped us uh, enable us to add to the answers to frequently asked questions um, on the on the website. And so there's also our communications department has done a really great job and is continuing to provide information on social media, um, our district social media, as well as our website, and then add to that based on questions that we're receiving. Uh, so just wanted to put that <laughs> little reminder on everybody's uh, brain and to remind everybody that you know ballots did drop in homes over spring break and election day is the 26th so it's important that everybody lets their voice be heard and and votes and gets their ballot back and signed <laughs> so it doesn't get returned um, in time that happened yeah. to you too Ron? that happened to me once it happened to me yeah, once too i learned live and learn <laughs> perfect thank you Zach, I know you've got something for us. Yep. Um, so we had the Student Superintendent Advisory Council this morning. Um, I think I was kind of, we were kind of reflecting back on as a group um, and, and talking before the meeting started. It was really cool um, because you know we've all been working and, and going to our schools and getting feedback, and so um, a lot of students that are really dedicated to uh, advocating for their peers and, and whatnot. So just a super awesome group to be a part of. Um, so we start off with COVID updates. We set the agenda for the most part. And so there were some students that just wanted to follow up uh, with what's uh, in our schools and, and with the mask being uh, and, uh, removed um, or optional, I should say. Um, and, you know, pretty well, it sounded like everything that has been communicated at these board meetings and has been communicated by the district is kind of 99% of what they're seeing implemented in the schools. So that was really good to see that that rollout's mm -hmm. been, at least from those students and what those students have gathered really uh, strong. Uh, then we discussed the dre uh, dress code. It's been something that we've been look the group's been looking at even before I was on it uh, last year. And then they've, we've been, we've reviewed it two, three times this year. It's, it's been an ongoing, um, something like that takes a lot of stakeholder feedback because you're going to the students and when I say the students want is not necessarily practical for what the staff can do to implement it and, and really finding 
um, a balance between professionalism and allowing students to express themselves. And, and so I think where that procedure has gone is, is a really good place. And there's so much student feedback written in word choice and the way something will block a text to move somewhere else to make it more understandable and whatnot. So just a really uh, awesome job because when I look at it, you can see like, oh, I remember we had that discussion with that piece of information and that discussion with that piece of information. So tons of student feedback. And then we talked about um, some ways that uh, students have areas that we maybe uh, could use more communication with students that are, are not in a non-traditional model. So if they're in uh, running start or tri tech ways that we can improve uh, on communicating with them. And so we just started like a brainstorming of like, okay, let's really identify what is the problem. And then we're going to come back, um, get a, gather a lot of student feedback. So now that we've kind of identified like what are the, a lot of the problems, what are some solutions to those problems and, and kind of go back to like to CBC students and uh, Running Start, I believe there's at WCU as well and, and TriTech and really go to those students that are actually in those programs and be like, what is the solution? How would you fix this if you could wave the magic wand and then we'll come back next month. So a lot of really good stuff came out of this meeting and thank you for having us. <laughs> Great work. Anyone else, Gabe? Um, yeah, I'll just real quick. So I attended the first uh, levy open house. Um, we had one community member there. And so I guess I am encouraging the community to attend the levy open house tomorrow. Um, th there's access to all the people that you need to talk to to answer your questions. And so um, I just want to thank Dr. Pierce and the staff for putting this together. Um, I think this is a great way for us to communicate with our community. Um, and I hope that those who have questions take advantage of the time and come down and ask those questions to get the, the correct information. So uh, thank you to your staff and I will see you guys tomorrow. Yeah, something similar. Uh, I I thought it was good. I can I um, when I went I went to the the one yesterday was it yesterday? I can't remember. My days are blurring together. But yeah, Ron was there. Yeah, and um, I thought that there's some really good uh, feedback. I, the one that kind of stuck in my mind was one of the guys really wanted it to be broken down a little bit more, which I I thought was good. I mean, you see these big numbers like 14 million and six million, and it's like and there are some bullet points, but he really wanted it to be broken down more. And I think that's that's a good thing for him to ask for. Um, I think think it was a good dialogue. So and I agree with Gabe. Like, this is the chance if if people have concerns or about the levy, this really is the chance to come. So I appreciate um, you, you doing that and putting that on and being there and, I, and all the staff that shows up. I mean, geez, you guys are just mm -hmm. at everything um, and it's amazing. So so I really, again, encourage the, the, the community to show up tomorrow. So. Thank you. Diane? So I attended the one that Gabe also attended, the first one. Um, I thought the gentleman there brought up really good questions and maybe it was because there were 15 staff members and one gentleman <laughs> from the public. Um, he got a lot of attention, but he brought questions from his friends, which I thought was very helpful. My friend says this, my friend wants to know that. So I thought that gave a good chance to disseminate information back through him to his friends. and so. If you're, if you want to come tomorrow and your friends want you to ask questions, bring bring their questions along. Um, I do want to say something about your ballots. So if you're going to mail your ballots in, you have to mail them before the is it the 26th? Is that our drop line? Mm -hmm. So our ballots have to go from here to Spokane to be postmarked. So you have to mail at least three days in advance, is what the um, post people will say to you. Or you can use the drop boxes, which just are, do it now. The drop boxes are much more uh, convenient if you don't want to mail it, but just because I know somebody last year or last time said, oh my gosh, I dropped it in the mailbox this afternoon and I said, sorry. And she said, I drove right by the drop box to go to the post office. So I just want people to know that. Um, so I was at the, a uh, couple weeks ago, the was nominating committee. I'm a member of that. And so we're working on nominations for um, board elections coming up uh, and that's interesting. They had another meeting today. I was not able to be there, but I'll get the, the minutes from that and I'll pass that along the next time. Um, let's see. There was a COVID briefing that I went to and I think because it's been spring break, there hasn't been much else going on. Sorry. Thank you. Ron, do you have anything to add? I do. 
I do. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending the National School Board Association meeting week before last. And uh, there are a lot of things that we need to keep our eyes and ears open on the national level. On a national level, it appears that schools may not be keeping, I mean, with the, our, our elected officials may not be keeping up with the rate of uh, not the, the economy, the rate of the increased cost to live uh, that we're seeing day to day, the average person. So we need to stay uh, stay on our elected officials that keep schools fun, uh, properly funded. And one of the requirements that's coming up, and I touched on this before, are the possibility of electric school buses coming up within the next, what, 10 years that the new administration is in. And uh, there were several school bus uh, representative, company representatives there. They are very, very, very expensive. And not only are the buses expensive, the infrastructure that it takes to maintain those buses and to give them the electric ports that they need, very expensive. And another thing that I was surprised about is the range is not very far. So therefore, the ports will also have to be placed between schools and destinations. Uh, like if you live out in uh, Finley, there may be a port requirement between here and Finley that you Sorry. would have to build. <laughs> I shouldn't have to, shouldn't laugh at that. I apologize. Yeah, it's okay. That's all right. I, then I almost cried. Because <laughs> I, and, um, and then the, if you have to supply heat and air conditioning to the buses, it decreases the range. So all those things, you, you, you know, it sounds good to say, hey, we're going to be, uh, you know, transitioning over to electric buses. It's not as simple as that. And, and I, I see that the post office ran into some uh, trouble uh, because they bought the standard uh, uh, emission, uh, I'm, I'm using okay. the wrong term, the gas powered trucks, yeah. uh, trucks, fossil fuel based fuels to use their trucks. And I can see why, to be honest with you, with the cost of electricity, I don't know if there's a win there. So I'm sorry to spend too much time on that, but be, be aware, just <laughs> listen closely what, what we hear, not only in the state level, national level and then uh, student involvement I, I thought about you uh, that was a great presentation from Washington State uh, from the student and believe it or not not nationwide the student involvement is not as good as it is here uh, so it, it showed well they showed well Washington State showed very well with them and another item is uh, full free meals full full, full uh, free meals for everyone uh, should be something that we really want to look at again. I think we have the attention on the state level. It's the national level that we want to make sure that our, our legislators and representatives are uh, attuned to what we actually need, not just want need. So, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, quick question. I really don't have anything to add since I was on spring break like everyone else last week. I had. So, going to the meeting tomorrow night because I was planning on going. So I know we can't have three. So Gabe, are you gonna go? Yeah. Okay, perfect. I just wanna make sure I could attend before we had to post a notice. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay, uh, next on the list uh, is reports and discussions. First off is the 22-23 preliminary budget. Mr. Roberts will be presenting. Here it comes, the hour. <laughs> Just to follow up on uh, what Ron was saying about the free meals, so the, the state did uh, lower the CEP thresholds and we're, we're fully planning on doing all free meals for all schools next year, so uh, that's a good thing for yep. everybody. Good. So we're going to look at a few uh, different funds today, but the general fund will touch on that again. Uh, the, the Associated Student Body Fund, the uh, students put together that budget and we usually don't get it till May and then I bring that uh, fairly simple and, and they always have uh, big plans with lots of expenses and revenues but a lot of times the trips don't pan out. But, uh, so we're going to talk a little bit today about the self-insured and we'll touch on the capital but first we'll get in the general fund again. Not a lot of changes from last time. So we're waiting from the state on these numbers here. This is 21-22. 
uh, awaiting this uh, final amount from OSP on this enrollment stabilization. That was a number that they presented <laughs> over a month ago, and uh, it could change since the uh, budget was adopted. And the rest of those are pretty firm there. And then just a reminder, this was the 21-22 budget. So uh, without the ESSER funds, it was 273 million, and then 283 million of expenditures for the 10 million uh, dollar deficit. And then when we added in the ESSER funds, the, the deficit on paper was 6.4. But generally, a lot of the ESSER reimbursements are up in this 283. We did add some costs down here, but not 8 million. Uh, most of the costs we're getting reimbursed are already in this uh, 283. So, so we'll make this up and break even and probably add a little bit to the fund balance. And this is the number we're working from when we work from new revenue, changes in revenue, changes in expended expenditures. We're either adding it or deducting it from this 10.4 million as we go through the presentation. So this is the revenue changes and we're talking about just the, the basic ad local funded uh, and that, that changes the deficit. If we get more federal money, that's really kind of restricted to federal programs and, and that doesn't really impact the deficit as it's supposed to break even. So you can see that there's not much change here except for uh, the levy equalization, the, the number they're giving me is uh, actually 970,000 more. And there is some adjustment there using uh, 1920 numbers, but but generally that should be plugged in here. And uh, that would increase uh, from 11.9 million to 13.2 million. And uh, so we're talking about pretty large numbers. Here's some of the numbers over here, you know, 87 million to 92 million. Um, the benefits here with medical 34.7 to 36.85 million. And then it's even more uh, cost when you add in the federal programs and some of those other programs. But uh, this is the local basic ed funding. Um, so their model will be coming out uh, April 22nd is when we can plug our numbers into the OSPI's model and verify what we're pro projecting. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. So um, Vic, it just might be a good opportunity to highlight the levy equalization because just again, we only receive that if the levy passes. That's right. So 14.57 going up to 15.54. Uh, with that adjustment they're giving us, you know, that's, we would lose 15.54 million pretty much. So this number here, 13, whoops, 13.2 uh, 13 million, that gets added to this 273. So 13.2 million plus the 273, and then that's our new revenue. And then plus any extra money we budget. So any questions there on the revenue? Sorry, there's not a lot of changes yet until we get some more information from what's behind. And then, uh, then the, the expenditure side, basically the staff costs is most of the changes. And a little bit of change here, uh, we're still looking at seven teachers at, at elementary, but uh, not quite as, as much money there, uh, you know, about 80 to 90,000 a teacher. Middle school staffing, five to six probably is, is more realistic. And then high school, uh, we thought we would probably be a wash, but we may need to add a couple teachers there. I mean, we do have more enrollment there. High school uh, did not lose as much from COVID, so uh, working through that. The online staff, so we're working through that, but it's probably five to 10 teachers that'll actually be reduced as more of those kids are going, have indicated they're going to go back to their home high school or home middle school elementary. So that should be, uh, you know, make the numbers look a little better there. And working on special ed, uh, other staffing, still working on some of that. Changes uh, from budgeted baseline to actual. So that would be, you know, when we do the budget, uh, you know, last year it's adopted, then we get some changes and there's bargaining different things. So uh, basically about 350,000 more uh, that was needed in the budget from the baseline, which is, when you're talking about $150 million, that's that's pretty good. Um, projected increases in staff costs, inflation, so that would be, a, you know, applying, uh, you know, steps, people advance based on years, uh, the cost of living adjustments, and, and all those type of things. So we're looking for roughly, uh, so far, about 13.3 or 5 million, and that, that will change some more as we uh, go through another couple of meetings. Vic, hey. The online high school, is, is that staffing included in, in your? Well, it's uh, right question. now it's about 16 teachers. So if uh, if we keep that, then there's no change. But if they go down, it's going to change uh, 
you know, you, if you lose 10 teachers, it's going to be about $800,000 negative right here. Okay. So can I piggyback onto that? So would any of those move in? They would have the option to apply for or not apply, but they would they be moved back to, into the other schools because they do have seniority. So how does that? Uh, they're non non uh, continuing. Contracts. Okay, all of those contracts yeah, work. Okay, much. thank you. Yeah. So the yeah yeah the the many of the teachers who were hired not all but into the Endeavor online mm -hmm. and also MCP online were um, leave replacement like one year non continuing okay. contracts. So and and they were aware of that. But the people who have continuing contracts in the district, they are then moved to, you know, another position where there's a need at the school. Okay. So at this point, I just want to clarify, we're not we're not talking about any reduction in force or RIF notices right. at this point in time where no. it's essentially, attri you know, attrition and moving people to where there's a need. Yeah, these are elementary retirements and then, yeah. right. okay. you know, so. Yeah. The endeavor is still in place. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, they're just they're, some of the kids are leaving, so they don't use the teachers. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So then down the list here, the, like I said, some of us will change. Uh, certificate of classified, uh, these pools is where you get your coaches' contracts, stipends, uh, leave cash outs, all sorts of things. So when cost of living goes up, those things go up too as they're tied to salaries. So a little bit of change there. So this actually is, has increased. And uh, over the next few board meetings, it'll, it'll keep changing as we get through these numbers. And then the bottom number really hasn't changed. We'll come back to the non-staff costs at, at one of the future meetings there and have a few more details on that. So this is uh, about uh, 12.7 million, and that would be added on to this 283.6 million as increased expenditures. So then I want to go through just uh, some bullet points here on, you know, the deficit and, you know, the next couple of years, what, what, you know, what, uh, make sure we're all on the same page. So 21-22, you see we had $10.4 million deficit. Using ESSER money, we maintain staff and uh, our fund balance will, will actually uh, continue to be around 45 million, maybe 45 or 50 million. For 22-23, we're still projecting a deficit around 10 million. Um, hopefully that will come down a little bit as the numbers get better. Um, after the application of ESSER, we should actually end with no deficit. So, you know, we have about $25 million of remaining ESSER funding. And uh, to use that over the next couple of years, one of the biggest costs that we can get reimbursed for is to maintain staff. So, uh, you know, we could reduce a lot more staff because we don't have the enrollment. But one of the purposes of ESSER is to maintain staff and you know, lower class sizes does uh, help with instruction and those things. So, um, you know, 23, 24, we'll still have enough remaining ESSER to fund another deficit of say $10 million. Uh, again, we have 25 million or so left and that's a lot of money to, to roll through and maintaining staff is, is one of the biggest ways to, to utilize that money. Uh, how many more staff could be reduced for 23-24 if enrollment does not increase elementary? Right now, you could reduce another 20 staff. And middle school, probably at least another five, maybe five to 10. And then we, we also have the online staff, but that'll probably already happen this year since the enrollment's uh, moving to the home schools. So we keep that in mind. You know, hopefully enrollment goes up. You know, if enrollment does go up right here, um, would you need new staff? Well, elementary, probably not. It'd have to go up a lot. Uh, so, you know, the, you wouldn't need any new staff. Middle school, uh, it's maybe or probably not. Even if it went up, it'd have to be significant to where I'd be coming and say we need to add staff. There's just, uh, it's probably not going to happen. Um, so 24 25, there's no more ESSER funding. Uh, the targeted bu budget deficit should be around a, a negative 5 million. That's pretty um, uh, doable. We have a lot of unfilled positions and different things that doesn't get spent. So five million is is, is uh, manageable, and uh, it's probably the target. You know, after that extra money goes away. So how do you get from 10 million to five million? Uh, you know, if there's staffing that would have to be reduced. If we don't have the enrollment, you know, some of the staff would uh, continue to be reduced. And not just certificate. You look at classified. 
eliminate positions that have not been filled. So, you know, during COVID, we had a lot of people leave and a lot of those positions weren't filled and they're still in the budget. And, um, but some of those positions, I mean, we actually need to, to run the district. We've just been trying to be, uh, you know, manage things a little better through, through these, uh, these, you know, different type of times we have. But, um, you know, we'd like to keep those in and, um, you know, the, the thought is the, the necessary positions, they were filled at one time. Once you take them out, it's a little hard to put them back in. But if we got to the point where, you know, we really had to find some money, they would have to come out, you know, if, if they're still in the field. Uh, right side school staffing, you know, we have some schools, uh, elementary is 350 kids, some with 700, and there'd have to be some of that going on. Would that result in some savings? Yeah, probably, but uh, that, that's a, that's a big issue that's probably going to be coming back to, to the board at some point to, to get that to all smoothed out through boundaries and things like that. Um, if we get enrollment increases, you know, that's going to going to help things out. And uh, there's still some some non staff budget items. Not a lot. We're pretty, pretty lean on the, the non staff costs. But uh, we go back through that too. So so given that. The, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can I clarify ESSER funding? ESSER funding is not, we were not given just tens of millions of dollars thrown in our budget. ESSER funding is we spend it, it's reimbursed to us, correct? So it's not this right. huge sum of money that was just like we won the lotto. It's right. spend it, get it reimbursed, right? Right. Okay. right. And so you see the, none of the, the $10 million deficit, we're not asking, the levy's not covering that. That's on us to fix. So when we go through all the numbers, uh, there is uh, no amount of levy that is covering this 10 million. So you look at this chart here, and this shows the levy amount we're going to get, the property tax revenue increase. Uh, here's the increase from that revenue page, 13.2 million that we, a few pages back. So the levy amounts here, we still have the $10 million deficit. We're not asking voters to come in and give us $10 million, right? We don't have the enrollment to support this forever. That's on us to fix. So, um, that's just we have to keep that in mind over the next couple of years and you know you take five million dollars out of this then you'll bring this down to some manageable numbers and and uh still even the levy you know i only have a couple dollars in here 210 220 which is reasonable increases so uh you know you know over time that could change up here with some of the numbers uh the social emotional learning staff we're going to get more money in the next two years whether we can actually I use some of that to balance the budget. I'm not sure because there's a certain level of staffing you have to have. Once you are below that, then you need to start using that money to hire new staff. And then, you know, if, if we're paying staff, you know, $80,000 a person and they're only giving us 65 or 70, well, we have to figure out how to make that work. And there's ways to, to do that. It's just, we, we don't need to get in those details right now. But uh, so down here then is the, the the cost that we talked about here, 12.782 million, that's from the previous page. That's the increase in expenditures. That leaves $9.9 .9 million deficit. And uh, we expect that, you know, hopefully to go down as we get some new numbers. Um, and then the next year again, if nothing really changed, you'd be about 10 million. But uh, given the extra money, you know, what you saw is, is what we're working with for reducing staff at this point. Um, and just moving forward, if there's any, uh, you know, issues with that, then you, we need to be on the same page, you know, moving on. Cause there's like, you know, a couple weeks left, a couple board meetings left to, to get this kind of mm -hmm. finished up. And, um, you know, this is kind of, kind of what we're working with right now, just right in here. So any, any questions on that comments, uh, keep, uh, this will keep getting updated. Got two more meetings and we'll bring it all together at the, the last meeting of May and then June and it's um, public hearing. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions? Sounds great. So that's a general fund. We'll touch on a few of these other uh, funds here. So the self-insured fund actually is probably more of a program, but uh, we're self-insured for workers' compensation and unemployment. We used to be self-insured for dental, but uh, the state put all the health and dental under, uh, under uh, their purview, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. So workers' comp, you see the adopted budget here. And a lot of times we put a contingency in there just in case there's any huge claims that come up or something just so we have enough budget capacity. Uh, as you can see, we're not gonna touch that. 
the regular claims are we expect about 500,000, which is below what's uh, budgeted there of 600,000. And the premiums we get are, are what's paid in by employees that uh, comes through payroll. And uh, the labor and industry cost is another big one. We still, even though we're self-insured, we have to uh, pay the state uh, various fees and assessments uh, for workers comp. Excess in insurance coverage for, for large scale claims that might happen that, that cover us in case you get uh, huge uh, claims over millions of dollars. So generally the projected is, is gonna come in probably break even. Uh, the budget is really pretty similar to the one uh, that we're currently in. Uh, premium is about 1.3 million. Again, uh, claims about 600,000 and the placeholder here for contingency. And uh, so on paper, this looks like, you know, we would, uh, you know, dip into that money. But like I said, there's a contingency here and claims probably hopefully would come in about 500,000. And then with unemployment, um, some premiums also that uh, come through uh, payroll about 100,000. We really don't expect a lot of claims this year. We're projecting 30,000. Um, last year we actually had more claims, but then they had some COVID money and they credit us back. Uh, we have a credit uh, going on right now and that's why this is pretty low. But normally we expect uh, 50 to 100,000 dollars of claims. So the, the budget for next year would be about 150,000 just to be safe with a contingency amount of 50,000. And um, it would just be 100,000 of revenue, 200,000 of uh, expect, expected claims. And we don't expect it, you know, that would probably, uh, probably come closer to 50 to 100,000, but we wanna have the capacity in there. And that's really it for the, the self-insured uh, funds um, or programs. Any questions on that? Capital fund is uh, lots, of, lots of information. Where's the math people when you need them? What would they have? <laughs> <laughs> there that, she is. Some right of there. that deficit so stuff. Man, some of that deficit stuff. That's scary math. You know, mm -hmm. it, it is not sustainable. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like she was saying about the. What the Turn that into a math problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the capital fund, uh, you can see the, the budget 21 22 and some projections there, and, and we're doing fine. <laughs> uh, coming in a lot better here than, than the budget. Preliminary budget. Some state maps that would be for the Ridgeview project, uh, technology levy, you know, we levy about $4 million. It's, it, it, it passed, goes up to about 4.2, 4.5, and, and some of those those cover a couple of different years. That's why the numbers are slightly different than what was on the levy. Uh, Tritech gets a little bit of money from some of their districts to put in for uh, maintenance type projects. So the land, uh, I think we touched on this a month or two ago. This is about $2 million for this uh, Riata uh, roads and infrastructure that probably will be happening in the next couple of years. We have school sites up there and have to pay our share of the, the roads that go in and as sewer and water. So so that's building the roads in preparation for the school? Is that what that is? Well, no, that's building the roads. The developer wants to build his houses and he needs to develop his roads. And since we're adjacent property owner to that roadway, we have to pay our share of the it's figured out based but that'll, on. But, that, but that's for the infrastructure, the, the road infrastructure, which will lead to the school eventually. Okay. Yes, okay. It, it, we're, we're like right on that, would be right on the street. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then engineers kind of figure out how much you know, water, sewer we use and how much our cost is and things like that. And so uh, Kamayak and Southridge, uh, those projects, there would be a little bit of retainage probably left on Kamayak and Southridge that we want to budget for. Um, that could be paid this this year, but probably will spill over in the next year. The Ridgeview project, they estimate about 30 million. You know, we're already spending money here uh, this year on architect and design. Could be a little bit spent this year on uh, construction if they get going into this summer. <clears throat> but um, we, need, we need another 20 million in here for the budget and, and then another 8.5 the following year uh, at least. And, and then uh, we usually have a placeholder here for various projects, about 1.5 million. And those are listed over a year. Some of the projects that, that uh, actually some of these will actually be going on this summer. The Kamayakin roof is uh, $375,000. And some of these will be taken out of the general fund. So we have an opportunity, you know, with some of our one-time money, with ESSER and things like that, we can kind of kind of move some things around and get the best bang for our buck out of uh, either the capital fund or the general fund. 
so the the building roof lamps and lighting change out um, that's going to happen this summer that's to get the 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 light bleed and, and replace all the the bulbs so it, you know you don't get that light pollution uh, those uh, fixtures and bulbs need to be replaced anyway they're, they're useful lights is uh, pretty much done so that's going to happen this summer uh, we're looking at reader boards it's about six schools five schools and the, the admin office so we have uh, four or five inoperable reader boards in some of our schools. Um, they're expensive, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars. Other schools don't have the funding to really, you know, get out there and get them changed. So, uh, kind of like a phase one is to hit. Uh, where there's, like I said, five schools, and the admin building one doesn't work. That'll be a more of a monument type sign signage there. So, any questions on that? I think it's Canyon Views doesn't work. Um, Park is not good. Southridge, Edison doesn't even have electric reader board. Uh, Highlands is using old uh, district office reader board from 10 years ago. So there's some things to, to knock on. Where's the, the sign in the, is, the budget in that? His is different than ours. I, I was wondering the oh, same okay. thing. Yeah. Yeah, so it's third oh, one down. Yeah. 225000 Oh, I added that. Sorry. Go, yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's all good. I, I'm a little slow and I'm going back to a question I was asked before about the roads, the infrastructure at Riata. Mm -hmm. it, my memory is that when we build uh, Forenza, the, the school that's presently there, we did infrastructure work to get that, the road down to that school. So I think the question before was this, this for present schools or schools in the future? And schools said, in the future. Yeah. Okay. It's just a, right now it's just dirt up there. Okay. All around. You can go to the top of Riata. Okay. <laughs> we have two school sites. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So uh, I'm looking at the Kamayakin 500 roof and the 200 building wing flooring. So I, this is past, but would it have been possible to add that on to the new building at Kamayakin and have done that at the same time for a less price? Um, I don't know if it could have been done at less price. I mean, we've been knocking out the flooring. Uh, Eric uh, Bruce is here, and uh, I've worked with him on some of these these uh, you know projects coming up. You can maybe explain a little bit on that, but um, it's I, I, you know we get we get KCDA discount on that. Right. Because the um, the contractor would not go through KCDA. Okay. You're Thank telling you. me we got a discount, and it still costs that. Yeah, it's cooperative. You know, I you know I worked in the roofing community, and I guarantee I could get that roof done for half that. <laughs> I know. I think we brought this up before, and yeah. Yeah, I, I just these prices just are just insane. Prevailing wage. So it's and yeah, we have to pay prevailing wages and things like that, but we'll continue to try to get the best price. Um, so yeah, we're, we've been looking at the parking lot overlays. We did some last year. If you don't stay on top of that, you lose your whole parking lot and have to just tear it up and it's okay. twice as much. Zach, do you have a question? Well, yeah, what was the uh, acronym you used that started with the K? KCD. Yes. King County uh, Cooperative Directors. Directors. Okay. It, can you tell them what that is? So they go out and they'll do bids. So if uh, for flooring, they'll put out an RFP and, and then vendors submit how much it's going to cost per square foot for different types of flooring. And then we don't have to go out for bid for that. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Ron, do you have a question? I do. And it was abstract, so bear, bear with me. A while back, we acquired some property from the uh, hospital there uh, across from uh, Kenilworth High School. Uh, have we decided what we're going to do with that? And is that an that item that we need to set money aside for? So the plan was to use that uh, for a ground staging operation for the other side of town. Uh, as uh, the first use of it mm -hmm. and uh, they have been moving their stuff over there and they use it for winter and the stage on this side of town there is really no maybe I think we did a little fancy there where we were planning on doing some fencing but other than that we don't plan on putting a lot of money into it for for the grounds type okay. of work okay I may be confused and I thought there was a site near the railroad that we were using for that that uh, effort is that that site for the railroad is basically storing all sorts of uh, um, furniture, equipment. Um, we have like ceiling tiles there that they go get for schools of a title 
uh, you know, uh, needs to be changed out. Lighting, okay. uh, there's still Kennewick High stuff there. It's more of a storage warehouse now. Okay, so bear with me, Vic. Not causing too much trouble. But <laughs> that, that, that site, maybe I envisioned it wrong. I thought the site there at the hospital was going to be more related to Kennewick High School than just a general storage area. I thought we were going to um, try to maybe possibly have the van have, I've seen this big van that they parked the mm -hmm. van out and the equipment is in that van. I thought this would be a better venue for the band equipment, other equipment associated with the school. Uh, there was no plans to use that building to store any okay. of that stuff. Okay. Um, the that building, was in my own head yeah. here. <laughs> okay. um, there is room, I guess. I think we did mention that at one time. Outside, you could maybe. Yeah. No, I wanted it inside. I wanted the band people inside. Yeah, <laughs> that's just me. That. Just me. So, yeah, we'll yeah. talk about it another time. Yeah. Yeah. Future plan. But we have got all the trio's chemicals out of there. Okay. Like oh, that. That's perfect. <laughs> that's a good start. Yeah. 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 Positive yeah. stuff. There. And that was kind of part of my question. We had talked before about there were perhaps some tanks or some remediation removal that we were going to have to do. So we went through all that and there wasn't anything that we had to dig up great. other than just cleaning out the the, stuff. Yeah. the great stuff they left us in the building. Oh, fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Nice. Yeah. So uh, down the list here, another big uh, project that, you know, it's not really anything we're doing right now, but um, the Southridge uh, field lighting is there's a lot of light bleed there, and those fixtures are also uh, getting close to their useful life. Uh, with all the residential development there, there is, you know, we'd like to try to look at that. Right now we have Kennewick High and the Kamayak, and, and if we get lamps and all those will have the, the what is it, LED lighting, or what do you call that? That, that you can dial it in and it doesn't really. It also makes spread. it less expensive for teams to rent it and things like that. Right, but uh, it is, uh, Again, my case is very expensive, 550,000, but we'll keep looking at that and uh, updating the board if we're gonna try to move on something like that. So so lots of things there, and there's others that I'm, I'm probably missing where um, there's space issues here. We're looking at a few things here and there to, um, you know, look at some, opening up some space, but uh, those are things that are, that are on the list. Uh, down the list here then, um, you know, information tech just offsetting the, the revenue here with uh, some expenditures as we replace uh, one to one every year in that cycle. Uh, so some of these numbers here. So normally we put in $5 million contingency and we would put in 5 million again. And that's mainly just to have capacity in case there's a big emergency, in case uh, you know, one of the projects, the elementary, something goes up where we need uh, that type of money and it's in the budget. And uh, usually doesn't get touched, but it does uh, allow uh, that type of uh, capacity. And then for Tritech, as remember, they were going to do a $5 million uh, add some space, so we would have to add that in here also. So I wanted to show the numbers here without those those costs, because this is really the bottom line we have to be concerned about. And we wanted to keep this around 25 to 30 million. Um, the next uh, capital levy would be February 25 or 26. And uh, you know that that's going to be a, quite a challenge, but uh, so you know if, if things uh, you know don't work out with that, we got to have this money down here to get us through some some years. And uh, you know we're waiting on the Ridgeview project. Want to make sure that's going to come in around our numbers, um, but we do need to plug these numbers in here. And Tritech will uh, end up eventually paying for this five million. Okay. There's a transfer of a million dollars from the general fund that would come from Tritech to help. Uh, pay for their, their cost. And then the state requires us to do a four-year budget. So that's why most of these uh, sheets that you see, except for the self-insured fund, they, that's more of a program. You'll see it four years on there. And there's a little summary that uh, goes to the state when we adopt our budget. So uh, those will be updated. And that's kind of what, what we're looking at there for our capital fund. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So on the five million for Tritech, so a million comes from Tritech's specific budget back to KS, back to Tritech our general fund. Tritech has money in the general fund that's set aside. Okay, thank you. So it'll come out of their pot. Okay. Yeah. And then the other districts that we share that with, do they can contribute so to they that? So they contribute some in, into this fund here, 
they contribute some up here. Okay. Tritech actually has some money in the capital fund down here. About, I think two or three million of this is Tritech's. So eventually, you'll, have, you know, he, he, he's going to have to use that eventually or, or pay back somehow. But he has enough money. There's enough money Tritech has on their own to to pay for the five million. They just don't want to use it all up. Uh, at once. Okay. So is that um, money that the other districts pay based on enrollment slots? Most of that money comes from enrollment. They don't pay it. It's just if they Thanks. manage the okay. budget, they'll it get the enrollment through. and can okay. set aside some money. Yeah. I think the other piece on that is it, it remember it's kind of front funding because when right. they be so their capital funding comes directly from the state. And so this was just allowing them to do the capital project a little bit earlier sure. okay. um, and then pay it back. So it's not really money coming out of our right. district pocket right. any more than any yeah. of the other member districts of Tritech. Right. Okay. Yeah, and they didn't they didn't want to like I said spend out all their money. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank they'll, you. They'll be fine. Yeah. All right. So that that's really it, and uh, we'll come back the next uh, meeting in May with uh, more general fund uh, information. Um, got two meetings in May to kind of try to try to wrap things up and make things uh, look a little better on paper, hopefully. Wonderful. Do you have any questions for Vic? I, I have a quick question, sort of off off topic, sort of kind of, but not really. Uh, we had a plan a couple of years ago, maybe three, showing when the schools were going to get, you know, renovated or replaced. Is that still available? If I want to show someone in the community, where can I show them or can I get a copy yeah, of that? So, and I thought Ryan might have said something. No, we, we, we did. I, missed, I think it was when you were wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah but we can get you that. Yeah. Okay. But the, ca the capital it's... facilities plan that gets updated every year yeah. is available on the district website and okay. we can send you the link. And that's something that gets reviewed, updated yeah. annually. Well, it, yeah, it's... so Ryan did the presentation on asset preservation yes. scores. Yeah, and I think that might have moved a couple schools around on that okay. plan. But that's what I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. Wonderful, Vic. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is the annual staff human resources update. Dr. Christensen will be presenting. Second delay on everything I say to make sure that it is. You got me on that. And from the beginning. So, thank you for uh, having me tonight. I'm going to report on all things employee and staff related. I'm going to hit some uh, areas in our strategic plan. As we, you see there at the bottom, we have goals for our staff to feel safe, respected, and valued. We also have goals to increase our staff diversity as well as our staff retention rate. So we'll hit all those tonight and a few other things. Um, <coughs> we'll report on some annual staff survey data that we've collected over the past year. Uh, talk about that, our recruiting and hiring efforts. There's been some talk about our substitute situation. So we're gonna report out on that a little bit as well as uh, some, what we do to support our staff and some new recognition ideas and programs that are coming out. And then finish with uh, how we evaluate staff. So first, our annual staff survey that we started this past year, um, we wanted to really, with align with our goal, find out how our staff feel about, you know, their jobs, how they feel at work, how they feel about their value, and we'll show you the questions here and the and the data that we collected on that. Really want to see where areas we are strengthened and areas where we uh, can improve. And we had 1,163 responses which is in all of our staff, and we'll talk a little bit about some strategies to get more responses next year. Here are the questions that we asked all staff, certificated, classified, um, there were 17, and really getting at, as you go down, you'll see a theme on you know how they feel about their jobs, how they feel about their value, how their contributions are viewed in their minds, 
Um, we asked some questions about how they feel about being accepted and belonging. Um, some really direct uh, questions. Uh, how the relationships with coworkers and supervisors and you know, respect and, and meaning that they feel in their, in their job. So, um, those were the questions we asked and now we'll show you the responses. So in similar presentations, you've seen this, these scales, the, the green and the dark blue and the light blue are good. Those are the ones we like. It's on the upper half, we don't agree. And so like the first question, I feel I'm part of my building or department. We have percentiles, 50% that strongly agree, 28% that agree, 14% that uh, we're neutral. Okay. The scale we used was kind of, we're changing it, we'll talk about that. But anything in those upper three are really positive. So you can see the different percentages and the questions along the bottom there. So the connection with coworkers is positive. Um, what my super expects of me, positive. Um, feeling safe at work, very positive. Um, opportunities to connect with coworkers, the percentages there, um, provided opportunities to learn and grow. And then we then we flip the questions a little bit to keep this the survey kind of, this next one was, it's hard for me to feel accepted. So we should see a reverse in the percentages and we do there. So that's that's a good thing um, that most of our staff disagree that they it's hard to feel accepted. Okay. And then uh, supervisors value my feedback. You can see the percentages there. A few more, another reverse question. Sometimes I feel I don't belong. So you see a larger percentage that disagree with that statement. Um, supervisors seem interested in our success. The coworkers and I are held to standards. I'm happy at work. That's a pretty simple, straightforward question and a lot of good responses there. And then the last five um, included, I, I really like the, the large, probably the, the largest percentage of agreement in all the questions was I find my work meaningful. And I think that speaks to people's feeling valued and that they're a contributor and they're doing meaningful work. Treated with respect, um, job utilizing skills and abilities, and then finally, the positive culture. So instead of asking you to memorize everything I just showed you, here's a little synopsis <laughs> of some of the stronger areas that we feel are strengths, feeling safe, feeling happy, finding their work meaningful, 98%, and utilizing their skills and abilities. And then on our opportunities to improve on those questions, they're still, they're still strong, but there's room for improvement, we feel. And, and, and especially the first two, just the overall participation rate, you know, 1,163 is less than half of our workforce. So with Robin's help in the communication department, we're kind of coming up for our next survey coming up, like how can we be a little bit more deliberate in getting it out, getting responses, we'll see some strategies around district level approach and then having the buildings and supervisors encouraged. So we'd really like to see that over 2000. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just the more people we hear from, the better reliable the answers are, right? And of the 1,100, only about a third of those were our classified staff, about two thirds were our certificated. So then focusing on that as well, get the classified staff to, and some staff probably aren't on there. Last year it went out via email and some of our classified staff and their jobs don't get on their email that much. And so we, that was something that we recognized we needed to fix. So we have some plans for that. We can always improve on our culture in our building, about 86% there, so feedback. Um, supervisors and valuing feedback. Opportunities to connect with colleagues is high, but there's still room there for, for it to be higher. And then the questions of feeling of not belonging, you know, 15% of our staff answered that. Yeah, I sometimes feel like it don't belong. We need to drill down on that a little more, as well as the being accepted. Those two, I think, a little bit go hand in hand. So that's some data from the survey. The next survey is coming out for this year and the next week or so for staff, and we'll have a window. Um, here's a little bit of our plan for that. As I mentioned, survey's coming out. We'll leave it open for a few weeks. Um, we'll use we're using a different survey. We're going to go to a different tool that allows us to drill down and break out some of the data a little better than last year's tool. And so we can not only share it at this level, but we can share it with buildings at their level and they can see their own data. So some strategies there. Um, 
we, we looked at the questions. We made sure that we, they were clear and concise. We wanted to keep them as close as we could to this year so that it's apples to apples we're comparing. Um, but I talked about that five point scale where the middle green was kind of like a, I don't agree, but disagree. We're going to eliminate that and go to a four point scale, which is strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. So we can make people make commitments in their answers, and not just sit on the fence. And uh, and then, like I said, we'll use that at both. You know, we'll report back in my next report to you next year on the data. We'll be able to compare. We'll have a couple of years, and then also getting that out to departments around here and out in buildings, so they can look at their own you know, their own data. It might be different buildings building some of those questions. So that's the survey. Um, just a couple other reminders and 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 new things for folks that have not seen this before. Our growth in the last seven years of employees is, I think, a lot higher than most people realize. When you look at our certificated staff in 2015 compared to today, you know, we've gone up 28%. Very similar in classified staff. A lot of that is seven years of growth and enrollment in, you know, in the district. Our substitutes have also grown, but not at the same rate. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then you can see like the total number of employees we do have some other part-time or casual or seasonal employees that aren't included in this number, but these are our ongoing regular employees, about 2,700 right now. So quite a bit of growth in seven years. Diversity, um, you know, we see some changes in, in, in our staff makeup a little bit. We see more uh, males coming into our district at both the teacher and, and especially the para level we've seen in the past. Um, some of our uh, smaller uh, populations have grown a little bit, uh, not as much as we'd like to see, but a big change you'll see there is the growth in our Hispanic employees, both on administrator, teacher, classified, that area is, it's, um, it's, it's growing more than the community, and I'll show you that slide in a minute. So it's kind of closing that gap a little bit. We have a long ways to go to mirror our student population and our community but it is it is trending that way. I have a question there. So is that your is that the express goal is to mirror the population? So in our in our strategic plan we're trying to grow our diversity by a couple of percent each year and so that we are yeah we're trying to be replicate what our student body and what our and what our community look like so that there's so my only concern is this is that you you maybe have two candidates that are that are you know I just want the kids to get the best education right and so I don't know that race or gender really makes a teacher a good teacher I understand that yes you teachers want to relate and stuff like that and I'm not discounting that but but if you have a, a candidate that's clearly a better candidate I would like to hire that person regardless of race and gender because they're a better candidate a better teacher potentially and i just hope that we're not not like push sidestepping that just in order to hit quotas and stuff like that no that's not the approach at all okay. we also want the best candidate but we want to increase our pools of candidates sure. so that we have a yeah. wide variety and diverse pools so we can go get those great people okay yeah. um a little bit just on teacher the last slide was just all employees but just teachers in the classroom were still predominantly about three to one for k-12 of female teachers versus males um here's our teacher diversity rate ratios you know the last slide showed that we were about 70 17 percent hispanic latino in the district of that 17 percent about 10.8 or 11 is on the teacher side and the other six percent or so is on the classified side this so you can kind of part that out a little bit in comparison to our students when we talk about you know our student diversity data primarily the you know the majority of our students are either uh, white or hispanic latino smaller population populations for our other races uh, okay another question again sorry you know i, I just have little I, I i don't know biology really well but pretty sure that like an egg and a sperm 
make a person that has X, two X chromosomes or an X and a Y chromosome, that person has certain plumbing. That's that's actual facts, right? I mean, I can't have two oranges and two oranges and say that's five oranges. It's just not, right, math teacher? I just don't, what is gender X? That's how, this is state data. And so when students uh, or their parents enroll or, or put them into our student information systems, that is one of the one of the options that they can choose. So you're that mandated by the state. And in law, students yep. have the okay. ability to identify as non-binary and how that's coded in the student information system is gender X. It's the code that's in the student information system. Yeah. So it's how the it's student biology, themselves though. are identifying. I mean, yeah, I can say I'm a 14 year old girl, but I'm actually not, right? I mean, I'm just physically not. But it's, but it's the law. Okay. They, have, they have that option to, to okay. make that choice. Yep. So just so you know, we didn't interpret the data in, in our HR department, come up with that. That's how it's reported. This is actually a SNP of data from the um, state OSPI yeah. report card. Yep. Okay, thank you. You bet. <laughs> so then when you kind of put student, teachers, and community percentages together, so you can see it's sort of across the board, you know, very similar in some of our areas and then and quite different in say our uh, you know our teacher our white teachers versus the community percentage are white and the opposite you know kind of runs the opposite with the Hispanic the, the inverse there okay. one of the things that we're really proud of and, and you know we often get to hear of things that are people don't think are good, you know, and sometimes teachers will tell us things that really bother them. But in the past seven years of all the new people we've hired, we've retained them at a 92 and a half percent rate versus a state average. Of That's very good. So there's lots of yeah. good things that keep people, especially mm -hmm. teachers, working for us. And so we can't forget that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get to focus a lot on the, the other side, but there's a lot of great things there. And that, and that stability is good for the community. And the students. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah. So some of our recruiting and hiring efforts, we'll share some annual efforts and then some new things that are exciting that are going on. So annually we attend some job fairs. We send teams around the state and they're you know publicized and teacher candidates come and we try to grab the best ones we can. We try to grab especially our high needs areas and our special education and bilingual education. You'll see over the next if you haven't already, over the next few weeks, we're having a job fair here in this room at the end of the month. We annually, we usually get quite a few people, both out of college and we get some looky loos from other districts trying to peek in on what, what we're doing and maybe try to come over to Kenwick, which is you know exciting as well. We have some things to offer. Um, we sometimes will just bypass those job fairs and always contact certain universities directly for our hard to fill positions. We try to maintain and establish relationships with, say, who's running this special education teacher department at Gonzaga or Eastern. And is there times that we can just make some direct connections there and, and recruit? Um, you'll see it on our web pages, some testimonials that Robin and her department have created that are very good and very engaging. We show them quite often whenever we can um, from all types of our staff, both uh, administrative teaching, classified. Uh, we, we, we made an effort this past year to get engaged more in maybe some Latino specific job fairs. With COVID, a lot of the opportunities were kind of limited and shut down but we have signed up and we're part of a kind of an online forum with some things on the west coast to try to attract more candidates and get more inquiry there i know um, we'd like to expand that into our, some of our other diverse ethnic areas as things open back up i think there'll be opportunities to do that um, doug i'm gonna interrupt you for one second if i may so you know you and i spoke about this mm -hmm. last year is I, I I like the fact that we're doing stuff online. I like the fact we're working the local the local schools. But again, maybe we need to send some people out to cover some of these yep. other areas. Go to go to you know heavily Hispanic areas, Southern Texas. Yep. Go to go to Southern Arizona, Southern California. Yeah. There's lots of people looking for. At least I'm me rephrase. I would hope there'd be lots of people looking for jobs. And so 
you have boots on the ground, you know, for a couple thousand bucks, we can send someone to go down there, go to these job fairs, get in front of them, and say, hey, come to Washington. <laughs> That's exactly our plan. We, we tried to do that this year, and everything was still shut down. Okay. Good. Good. So the only opportunities that I could find all over the, you know, whether it's the southwest or the south or east coast were predominantly online, and they're obviously not as effective as being in front of people, but we are, we will pursue that. Wonderful. When Thank it you. opens back up. Yes, sir. Are we also working with a local Tri-Cities and Kennewick uh, publication, not publication, but uh, public affairs group, the, the ones that I want to say tri but I don't know mm -hmm. if they still exist. But those tri groups that... Oh, it's the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce, that great big group now that they changed it. The tri it should be called tri Right. So those efforts was to get... Yes the positives of our community out. So we get working with them so that when we do recruit people, we can also say, look how much sunshine we get every month of the year. Prior to COVID, I spent, I <laughs> have been invited twice to that people group don't know to speak. Uh, they do monthly right. meetings and I have had that opportunity. I hope those open back up again. But my my question and my, my mention in this is beyond this area. It sort of goes with what you said. Uh, where I'm from in North Carolina, we don't know that, well, people in North Carolina do not know that you have such a spot here. Right. So how can we get that from what you said and also working with our local groups that's publicizing the Tri-Cities, trying to get industry or what have you. At the same time, we said, look how great our schools are and how, how well we pay our teachers and a lot of lot. Yeah, for sure. I'm not trying to do your job for you. No, no. I'm just <laughs> doing it. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, those are good ideas. So those were sort of the annual things we do. Some long-term, one particular thing that we wanted to note tonight for you is, is there's been quite a few of us from various departments here that have put together the last year or so an effort to grow our own teachers right out of our high schools into college programs all the while working with us as maybe you can prepare educator part-time jobs and then when they graduate having teaching jobs with us so we've done a lot of legwork on um, you know getting some grants to do the to do the study and the investigation to partnering with the local university uh, so we have high school classrooms in our high schools that have for teacher prep, there are people that are interested in being teachers, and we've specifically focused so far on people that want to be bilingual educators. And how do we transition them with WSU Tri Cities? From I just graduated, I'm accepted into WSU Tri Cities. Here's my course of study. Here are my scholarship opportunities. The school district is offering me some part-time work as a paraeducator when I'm not in class, and keeping just sort of that cohort going through. And then, you know, it's a long-term effort. It takes four or five years, but then having just those people that have already gone to our schools, worked in our schools, come right back and become teachers for us. It's a very, we're excited about it. Sometimes you go, oh, four or five years, that takes forever. But hey, we're already over a year in, so. I can go ahead and Oh, I just wanted to make a comment because I didn't even get a chance to talk with you about it yet, but I actually spoke to a student today who's a member of the Superintendent Student Advisory Council who participated in Teaching Academy, is interested in being a paraeducator, is a bilingual student, and I'm connecting him with um, Tony our, in our HR department uh, and right. Alyssa um, from federal programs and Sarah to talk with him specifically about you know how does it, how does the application process work? What does he need to do? So we're starting to see <laughs> there's a, there's some a, uh, results seed. from our efforts. So uh, yeah. do we tap into the retirement community? I, I noticed that work on retirees are getting younger and younger, and some retiring at 50 may realize at 52 maybe I'm retiring maybe just a bit too early, and is a, a we are. We do have uh, um, quite a few retirees from other industry that have come to be subs for us. Okay. Uh, every once in a while, I'll meet somebody that's gone and got their teaching certificate that wants to actually be in a full-time teaching career. We have a few, but mostly they come in as substitutes, kind of 
So is it any way to reach out to them versus them reaching, you know, you're having a few stumble into us instead of you actively go into the retirement community and say, hey, have you ever thought about? Yeah, I, we haven't done any concentrated focused efforts on that. I don't know if there's a pool of, you know, biggest, you know, retirement from different industry, but we could, we could definitely reach out to some of the larger employers. Right. You know, Some very smart people are retiring. Just, yeah. I'm just throw that out there. <laughs> I'm not one of them. Yeah. It's not smart smarter, not retired. And not both. <laughs> so we are seeing a trend the other way in, in our teaching pool. People seem to be staying longer than yeah. they used to. Yeah. Okay. For various I, reasons. I have a quick question uh, regarding the bilingual educators initiative stuff. Have we as a district thought of somehow providing Spanish um, classes or something to current teachers who may want to look to be um, get into that bilingual field. Maybe say like if they go out and get Rosetta Stone and become bilingual, like would we could we reimburse their $250 class or is there a way that we can do something like that to kind of incentivize current teachers to maybe take on that? There are grant monies and I'm looking at our federal programs director Alyssa, but there are grant monies that they use each year for teachers to go out and get those additional endorsements like ELL endorsement, special education endorsement. We do have some some opportunities there. Is there anything you want to add to that? No, we're there. One of the challenges in bilingual is it's such a high academic and so we can't Sure. If somebody comes in and says, I'd like to, you know, is there a way that I can become bilingual and teach in that part of the district? We'll, we'll assist them, we'll figure out opportunities for them. Okay. Yeah. Good question. That work for board members also. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to teach and you're tired. Some data on our current substitute situation, just looking. Um, here this year, this might surprise some folks. We've actually hired over 110 substitutes this year, which makes our active pool about 210. So there is some, you know, some people fall off and get full time jobs. Some of our subs are just starting and then they get into positions. A lot of our subs will sign up with Richland Pasco Kennewick to guarantee that they're somewhere every day. So when it, so not all 210 are waiting by the Kennewick School District phone every morning. So we just don't want to misrepresent that number. Um, we have looked at, you know, we raising substitute pay as part of our incentives um, to attract, but we have hired quite a few and we're getting a lot of really quality substitutes too. Same thing on the classified side. We hear about parent shortages and, and things like that. We hired over 182 classified substitutes since the beginning of the year and looked at their pay and adjusted it accordingly. And again, like the teacher subs, a lot of our pre-ed subs will start subbing and then while they're subbing, they'll see open jobs and apply and move right into a position. So when we look, another thing that I think is important to talk about when we talk about our substitute situation is just our absenteeism rate for our employees. Um, before COVID, typically our, our teacher absenteeism kind of mirrored our student. You know, any given day, you know, it was 94, 95% attendance for kids and 94, 95% is for staff. Currently, coming out of COVID, uh, most days were 12 to 14 on good days. And back in January and February, where a lot of people were sick, it got as high as, you know, over 20% on some days. It was just really, really. And as, as you remember, we did some mitigating things with, you know, a lot of our current teachers are covering. We tried to, to uh, compensate them for taking on that extra more than usual thing. Um, so on a very, very good day, if I pull up at 8 a.m. on my system and there's only 80 teachers out, I'm elated. That's like out of the possible probably a thousand that need subs. So, you know, so it's less than 10 percent, right? Yeah, so it says currently, like, and then this is IE January, February, but we're in 
April. So I mean, like, is, uh, right now, were you like 12 percent, 15 percent? 12 to 14 right now. And then, and that's back in January, February, it was as high as 17 to 19. Right. And that's why is it higher right now? What's the uh, more people are either Flu ill season. or you know taking sick time. So Thank just you. something to, that we're going to look into. Um, by school, you know, we can just get right down to it. You know, there's all the elementary schools and the number of teachers that would need subs in their building. You know, how many days in March? We took March as our data point. <laughs> we kind of came out of the really, really bad in this month. And so back to a little bit more normal. So you can see some schools in March had up to eight days where they had 10 to 15 percent absences and some schools had zero. Um, and then we, I had in another column because there were some days that were very, very extreme, like 16 percent and above. And so you can see that it really uh, varies. It's not, you know, just on the surface, it's not a certain type of school or a certain part of town, but. Um, What's in the water at Edison? Yeah. It's good to bulletproof. Okay. Uh, Here's the same data for middle schools. Sorry, just a quick question. The 16% plus absences, that's that's the staff. So 12, so. I'm mean, just talking about teaching staff. Right? So in, at Amistad, there was 12 days where 16% or more of their staff were out absent or sick that. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yep. So do we have any guesstimates on like why we see a swing like Edison like he was saying, zero uh, in the 10 to 15 and zero in the 16 plus, and then we see other schools struggling a lot more, like Amistad and Fuerza. Do we have any guesses as what's causing such a dramatic? So our plan is to go out and talk with those administrators to look at some, uh, are there other variables involved here? We just kind of put this data together in the last week or so. So Thank that's you. the plan. Yeah, you're, you'll see that in my next step slide coming up. Middle schools, the number of teachers again are the ones that would have need subs. I, I don't include like a counselor or a, something like that in there. We typically don't get subs when they're out of the way. So you can see, you know, Highlands and Chinook had more absences than some of the other middle schools. And again, it's just a pretty fresh data for us too. So we want to take a look and try to drill down on, you know, are there things that we can see that are affecting that? And then there's the high school as well. Okay. So just to, just to kind of wrap this up, you know, we've, we've hired a lot of substitutes that typically would cover the old absentee rate, um, but we do fall short on days when it's really high. And so we have things in our contracts to, you know, have teachers cover and how we pull folks to do different things in the classroom. You know, we have contract language around how we compensate them for that. And you know, finally, it's just it's different from building to building. So as Zach mentioned, how do we figure out why? You know, our next steps are to look at those rates um, for subs, look at the rates by building, um, analyze why some buildings might have higher absences than others, and um, make some plans for it. Is there some fixes here? You know, is it just a, you know, we don't know why. So we'll, let's go out and find out why. Okay. It could be that one building had two or three people that went out on some extended illnesses. Is that making their number higher? You know, we just need to look at that. Okay, transitioning to staff support and recognition. Can yeah. I ask some questions? I didn't want to interrupt no. while you're doing that. So. Um, when you're talking about doing the new surveys and you're going to break them down into buildings and being able to give building data, I'm concerned about the anonymity uh, of a person. So like a speech therapist, <laughs> there weren't a lot of us. And if I say I'm an elementary speech therapist, you can choose between 15, right? And if I say I'm the one at Edison, you know who, who that is. So I'm, I'm, I know that people are always concerned about giving best answers, but it could come back. It's different if I'm a math teacher at a high school. Mm -hmm. So sure. I'm, I'm just concerned. So I hope you will hold that in your thoughts when you okay. do that. I don't know how to make it so it's anonymous, but mm -hmm. 
at least think about that. So typically um, we would, and I know your <laughs> the speech very well. So that data would just maybe be shared with special ed director who okay. works with the speech therapist, not necessarily the building. Thank person. you. Then the other one was um, the increase in males. Can you disaggregate that by elementary, middle, and high school? I can. Because you know elementary is like 80 some percent females. Yeah, so. it tends to get a little bit more. Uh, there's more males that tend to work in the secondary. Correct. When you're talking about teaching. Right. We, we have seen quite a bit of growth in the paraeducator mm -hmm. males, uh, K-12, not just secondary. Right. But yeah, I can. In, in the can certificated. Um, the, the few that we lose, teachers, um, and, and anybody in the district, do you do exit interviews? We've started that process. We've done some and we're refining sort of like I like to do them personally yes. versus just the survey. Right. And so, so far we've been doing them personally and, and especially with uh, staff that are like, why would you teach here for 10 years and then go and it's, oh, my spouse got transferred in a job. And so we're annotating that. And then if we feel like there's a an exit survey that's alarming, you know, due to some reasons that we can control, then we'll follow up with that. Okay. You know, whether it's a supervisor or department. So yeah, we are doing some of those. And then, but I think we need to add to some, another level of, I, I like the face-to-face, -face, but we just can't get to everybody all the time, like all the classified movements. So we're working on a tool to do some of the okay. automated. Tools. I think those are really helpful. I'm, sometimes they're helpful, I guess. I they are. Um, and sub rates. I know we've talked about this before, Pasco, Richland, and Kennewick, like it's it's a game, you raise yours 10 and they raise theirs 12 and you raise yours one more. Is that still going on? Are we working we're, together? We're, we're working together and we're pretty close where it starts to differentiate is some of the, like someone might say, well, the starting rate is here, but after you've worked for this many days with us, we'll bump you. Okay. So that's sometimes hard to gather, uh, but yeah, we try to do, I mean, they're good partners. Everybody's got an interest in hiring people they want, but we're also aware of the market. So we try to keep it. We don't, we don't, to answer your question in a short version, we don't have people saying, well, I'm going to go work over here because it pays me. Right. Okay. And then the last one, um, teachers were getting uh, additional overage for covering. Is in that January and February? And that's over now. Is that correct? Yeah, we're kind of back to a more plateau. I mean, we still have our days. But we've we've sent that back out and it's kind of back to where it used to be so, there was always a a rate yes we had just but, put a little bit of a extra on there during, during that time because it was happening so often and so that ended when it ended in the in the march payroll okay thank you thank you all right thanks sam Staff support recognition, um, as you're aware, last year the legislature passed uh, a law that we put into a policy about having a district-wide mental health committee to deal with some of the post-traumatic stress stuff that our staff maybe take on either through their own situations or things that they <laughs> take on from students they work with. And so we put that we put that uh, committee together. We've met this year various times. We've uh, taking on the charge and the requirements of, you know, sharing resources, um, sharing out things that we can get for our staff, whether it's on the mental health side, on the counseling side. So that's up and running and going well so far. Um, and then reporting to the board, like I am tonight, uh, how that's going. Um, some of the other duties of our committee, um, OSPI and, and our school employees benefit boards put resources out and so we're we're making sure that those that water gets to the end of the row, so to speak, to all of our employees with links and connections there. Um, looking at the staff survey data, that committee, we had a chance to look at the data I shared with you tonight with that committee on some of those questions. Um, and then using that data to, you know, make plans and set goals and, you know, adjust our, you know, things as necessary depending on what we're finding out. We've always had staff recognition at building levels. You know, buildings do a great job recognizing their staff throughout the year. We have some district level awards that you're aware of, some regional crystal apples and some different things like that. We have a, a weekly kudos that goes out where staff members, you probably see it, they can 
you know, recognize their, who they're working with and the great work that they do. And then just where we're right in the middle of finalizing for this year uh, with Robin's uh, leadership and her department, years of service employee recognition program, which is buttons or pins. And uh, there's some samples of what they'll look like there. And uh, I know at least one board member will be interested in getting the retired one. I have to say that I'm so proud that we are finally doing this because it may not seem like a big deal, but it I think it is a big deal yeah. and, and cities and other businesses around here do it. Yeah. And I, I just think that that one additional piece of thank you makes a big difference. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting mine so I can wear it on my lapel. <laughs> Retired. Yeah. Yeah. I had a outrageous idea. <laughs> Why are you laughing so much? No, I think it's great. I love it. I, I, I did. Love it. I, it's really outrageous. But you know how we looked at coaches, uh, naming gymnasium after coaches? What if we name classrooms after teachers? Just just a thought. You don't have to answer. Well, I don't think that question's for me. <laughs> <laughs> just a, I, don't I think that question's for yourselves. Just think about it. Yeah, there's. Uh, I don't think it's outrageous. It's good. I mean, Wanda June Humbird taught for 47 yeah. years, right, in this district. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or oh, wing, maybe in the class. Well, there's certainly all, you know, we can certainly get them pins to start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Big, 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 big. Yeah, big. Yeah, big. Yeah, big. Yeah, big. Yeah, big. Yeah, such a small scale. No, I, I like it. Yeah. And so finally, just a reminder or some new information for you on just how we, every single employee, certificated, classified, coaches, what have you, go through a yearly evaluation process that's formal, that involves meeting with supervisors, setting goals. This is just an example of what the teachers and the administrators use um, through the different model. You can see there's criteria. Each principal will sit down with teachers. Each you know, principal supervisor will sit down with them, go through criteria. Reflections, assessments, goals, observations, uh, you know, data, and then a summative evaluation that's kept in their personnel file. So I've worked in the Kennewick School District for so many years. If you went up to my file, you would see an evaluation of me for every single year I've worked here by my supervisor. Yep. So that's kind of it. I know it was a mouthful or earful. Yes, So for TPEP, the teacher principal evaluation yeah. procedure. Um, do we, is there still an inter-rater reliability training for supervisors? Yeah, that's probably a good question for our principal supervisors. I know what you're referring to is when we first started using TPEP, we spent a lot of time as supervisors observing and scoring and then comparing right. to see what kind of are we do we evaluate the same way. There are still small groups of principals every year that meet regularly and, and do some of that. But Rob and Jack, is there something you want to add there in terms of? Can I, can I just ask, I know it's it's tempting to want to talk from the audience, but the people who are listening from home up, can't hear. Up, so if you can just down. come to a, a mic, that would be great. That was a comment we wanted to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the state and ESD right now are requiring recertification for TPEP. As a matter of fact, we've had uh, quite a few principals who have had a dedicated day uh, through Zoom and webinars uh, recertifying in TPEP. So that's something that's that's ongoing. We also are looking at uh, AWSP, the, the, the leadership framework. We look at the criterion for the leadership framework. So we're constantly pushing what they should be doing to be proficient and uh, you know uh, yeah. uh, how we measure that so yeah it's it's ongoing we're continuously not only training the principals but the principals are also training the teachers i know all of us are part of a monthly we call them learning walks but we'll get together with small group administrators go out to a school watch a couple teachers come back discuss what we saw and that's another ongoing effort to make sure that we're you know, everybody's seeing and recognizing and identifying what great teaching is. And so, yeah. Thank you. That's what's going on. I, I have a couple quick questions. Um, so, the, so the survey that the staff does, that's anonymous? Right now, it it's, it's not something yeah. like a safe it's schools training where we, we ask. I mean, we do ask, like, what building do you work in?
work in and what your what job you have so that we can analyze like wow we really have an interesting set of data here for secretaries versus our educators but it's yeah we don't ask them what their name is right okay i, I do like the fact that we're going to one through four because neutral yeah, can be interpreted at either good or bad depending on right. how you you want to do that um, as far as um, you talked about uh, absences and those things, are, are you going to look into like correlation with maybe sub coverage as well? So those schools that have those absences, are they actually getting subs or not? And maybe why? Because um, I think we've heard some schools don't get the subs like others do. So I thought that's something yeah, to look at. Yeah, there's a correlation there. Yeah. And then I know we do a teacher teacher's fair. We thought about doing like a sub fair. We do. We do. We typically, and we have one planned for August. August is a good time for our classified and substitute recruiting. Okay. Because it's just a few weeks prior to the need. So people looking for jobs. So we purposely kind of separate out the teacher one because this is the time of year where teachers are hired for the fall versus the classified, which is more of a summer. But yeah, we'll, we'll have that too. We And we have in the past done those. And the the last one is just for my I guess my knowledge, but the the degree requirement of a bachelor's degree for like a, an emergency sub that's a state requirement, or is that something that we can look at to potentially modify to maybe an AA degree or X amount of years of work experience, right? Because when you you throw the bachelor's degree in there, you eliminate half your pool or even more of qualified people that could come in and help. So I don't know if that's something we looked at or if that's a state requirement, but might be. We've talked about that, especially this winter when we were really, really hurting. Uh, you know, we had, I know of one district in Eastern Washington that went to the AA and I had some initial conversations with how that was going and there were some pluses and minuses to that. But it is, yeah, it's it's up to us to, whether we want to do that or not. So, so that leads me to the, the next question about so the teachers. Are teachers state required to have a bachelor's degree? Yes, that they are required, yes, but the subs sure. are not. Okay, all right. Yeah, all teach all approved teacher prep programs include a bachelor's degree and a teaching certificate. Okay. And endorsements in the requirements. Sure. Student areas. teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are some variations on how to get there, but at the end of the line, it's bachelor's degree for right. sure. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Hey, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Sir. you thank you. Appreciate thank it. you. Okay, next on our agenda is unfinished business. We're going to discuss policy number 3143. I'm on for the record. I, I would love you to start every sentence off like that. <laughs> you got this crazy. <laughs> okay, so uh, 3143 has been before the board once, so it's being presented tonight for a second reading. This is a new policy, one that I shared that I uh, came across when I was when we were updating the discipline policies and realized that this was something that we should have in place. It reflects our current practice and is consistent with the laws regarding uh, informing and providing information with regard to threats. And so I think that um, the last meeting, the board wanted a little more time to review the um, all of the language, and so it's being presented tonight for second reading. Yes, I read it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, any comments or thoughts on this? Uh, this is a new. What, what if this is a uh, policy? Policy. Thank you. Glad you're here, Zach. <laughs> um, any questions, comments, concerns? Mm -hmm. If not, I I'd like will to make approve. a move to for to approve for second reading policy 3143 notification of dissemination of information about student offenses and notification of threats of violence or harm. I have a first. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Perfect. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, I will call for the roll call vote. Mr. Galbraith. Yes. Mr. Valentine. Yes. Ms. Sunbeck. Yes. Mr. Mabry. Yes. Mr. Connors. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we have another policy to discuss. We have policy number 1431, Board of Directors, public participation for first reading. 
Great. So actually, um, this is one too that uh, the board had an initial look at at the last meeting, and uh, there's policy and then also procedure, and it's been updated to reflect again our current practice, modified to reflect some of the model policy language from WASDA, and the piece that we uh, that the board discussed most and that is updated in the version that you're seeing tonight in the procedure, so the R1431, is regarding the seating of time. So uh, based on the board's feedback, I, I went back and this is the wording <laughs> um, that I've highlighted here on the screen in the second paragraph of the procedure that I believe is reflective of what the board would like. It states, should a, speak, should a speaker exceed their time allotted, one other individual signed up to speak may choose to cede their entire allotted time to that speaker. Time may be ceded to a speaker by only one person. So I think Perfect. I captured what was talked about and, and the other piece that um, has been added since the last meeting based on board member question, and I consulted with Bronson on this, is um, this language right here about political campaigning. And there have been questions about uh, kind of what's what's the line between political speech or and political campaigning? And is it allowable to restrict political campaigning? Um, and Bronson is here, so he can clarify uh, anything if needed. But uh, essentially, the the bottom line is if the policy specifies that political campaigning is restricted, then the board can restrict it. It's just if there's nothing in place saying you can't come and campaign politically, and then people do it, then we then the board would be potentially in a place where we'd be restricting free speech. Do I, do I have that correct to Bronson or do you want to add something? That's correct. So okay. <laughs> um, when you provide a forum for citizen public comment, um, you can't restrict someone's speech if they're not on notice of in citizen public comment. You know, for example, you'll have public hearings on a, one topic and you let the, the public know this is what the topic is, this is what you talk about. In the citizen public comment, it's pretty open. So we have to put that in the policy so the public knows, okay, in citizen public comment, we can talk about anything except those things. So how do we determine that? Like Right, and I was gonna say, here's, here's where, where I think that the distinction is. It doesn't mean that someone who holds a political office couldn't come and make a public comment or say something. It doesn't mean that somebody couldn't say something that could be construed as politically charged. Mm -hmm in nature, but what it means is someone who's running for office couldn't come and say, vote for me. They I mean, could, that's kind of the simplistic way. Could they introduce themselves like I am so-and-so running for this office and then just as an introduction? Is that 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 probably be considered campaigning, but if they want to come and provide a public comment, say, my name is so-and-so, and then provide a public comment on something, you know, okay. some issue in the community, they can do that. That doesn't but not say the I am not say I am so and so I'm running for this okay. position please vote for me well but that was you know I'm, I'm with even without the vote for me I'm not I don't really want political campaigning but I'm just yeah. trying to get right. clarification but Micah that's a good question because that's cause that's happened twice they came in hi I'm so and so and I'm running for right. this position so as I'm sitting here do I say well hey stop you know we can't campaign you can well, say there's, I mean well, there was, it's like if they say like I vote for me, that's totally political, political campaign, to, in my opinion. But I think if they introduce themselves, I don't really know that that is. I would say that's political campaigning because if person A comes in, I don't know person A, but if they say I'm person A running for whatever it is, now I know. But if they get, but they can come in and introduce themselves and state their name, and right. then talk about yeah, whatever sure. what they want to talk sure. about. That's yeah. perfectly. <clears throat> But not a connection to specific. Yeah, that's right. the word I was looking for. Specific campaign. Okay. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Zach, when you run when you run for president, 
<laughs> I don't want to say that. You can come back and talk to us. Just <laughs> okay. Don't say that you're running for president. Yeah, just say so yeah. All right, do you guys have any other thoughts or comments on this? I think it breeds as yeah as I had hoped. Yes, thank you. So, okay. Mm -hmm. I will entertain a motion to accept or entertain a motion for 1431. I, I move to uh, approve policy 1431 public attendance and comment uh, as well as policy 1431 R public attendance and comment procedure first and second first and second reading I'll second I have a first and second any further questions or comments hearing none I will call for the roll call vote please Mr. Galbraith yes Mr. Valentine yes Miss Sunvik yes Mr. Mabry yes Mr. Connors yes thank you Okay, on to new business. We have an anti-vaping lawsuit. Hey, can I make one point of clarification? That was just a suggestion, first and second reading. I wasn't telling you what to do. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I, I appreciate it. it. That was my first one, so I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate the assistance through. Oh my I just feel like one. Gabe kind of stole Diane's job. Oh, that's a, second, <laughs> that's a second one. He's doing great. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, the the item for uh, board consideration tonight has to do with our uh, district's opportunity to participate in an anti-vaping lawsuit. By way of background, over 600 school districts in uh, 30 states have joined a lawsuit against the e-cigarette and vaping company Juul and its major <coughs> investor Altria. Uh, school districts are seeking to hold Juul accountable for costs that school districts are incurring or will incur to prevent, intervene, and educate against uh, nicotine use and vaping. And the first trial is set for late 2022. A little bit of data according to the statewide Healthy Youth Survey, which is given statewide to students, approximately 30% of 12th graders in Washington state self-report vaping in the last 30 days. That was from 2018. Um, the it's given every other year and it wasn't given in 2020 because of COVID, but that um, shows a significant increase, a 50% increase from a 20% vaping rate in 2016. Uh, cigarette use is much lower, um, it's declining. Uh, and so one way to interpret that data is that due to all of the efforts um, over the years around educating students about tobacco use and deterrent, um, those have been successful and, and that we need an equal effort toward um, educating about vaping and preventing vaping. Anecdotally, I think uh, it, it, we know that uh, it's an issue um, in our schools, not just our schools, but in schools in our state and across the country, um, and that, you know, young people are vaping and it is um, something that is concerning. School districts who participate in the lawsuit will seek monetary damage to offset costs related to teen vaping. We could use these funds to purchase vape detectors for restrooms, for example, to fund education about nicotine abuse, to support in intervention um, efforts, to potentially help pay for SROs, uh, any other creative ideas that we can think of um, to help prevent and educate. So there's no restrictions on the use of the funds should districts prevail but as long as it's a, as long as it's related to this or like no, it's, I, I, it's got to be used to prevent deter educate against vaping there's no cost for us to join the lawsuit um, in fact Stevens clay <laughs> law firm which represents numerous districts in our state there they've agreed to represent districts pro bono uh, to join the suit, the board does need to take action to provide authorization. And once the board authorizes, what is required of staff is we complete a questionnaire. Um, we provide some of our healthy youth survey data and some other things. Uh, Bronson and I have received the questionnaire and what's required. It'll take about two hours of staff time to complete the information. It's due back to the uh, law firm at the end of April. And then after that's done, there's really no additional staff work required. And so the recommendation tonight is for the board to authorize the superintendent to work with Stevens Clay Law Firm to have the district join the pending vaping lawsuit against Jewel and Altria. The, and Altria just FYI is the successor to Philip Morris. So that is the recommendation for consideration tonight. Do you have any questions? Oh, sorry, sorry. No, 
I just wonder if you have any questions or comments. Um, so when we join this and whenever that money may come through, that may take some time, will you be working with the health department and key connections because they're the, the key connections that we're a part of with the health department, that's our main goal, right? Is anti-vaping, anti-drug uh, use, abuse. So are they a partner? Will they be a partner with us in that? I certainly can. I mean, we are partnering with them now. Um, I don't think that they're required to partner with us to join the lawsuit no. or anything like that, but we definitely want to continue to partner with our key groups right. um, on these efforts. So, Because, mm -hmm. you know, they're the ones that send students out to find out if yeah. kids are able to purchase, yeah. students are able to purchase. Yeah. So That'd be good. Because it's a, it's a big community issue. It's not Absolutely. just within our school. Absolutely. It's not schools. just a school issue. So, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so we need a motion to approve this, I would imagine. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the recommendation that the board authorize the superintendent to work with Stevens Clay Law Firm to have the district join the pending vaping lawsuit against Jewel and Alteria, the successor to Philip Morris. I have a first. I'll second. First and second. Any other comments or discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, next on new business is policy number 3550, Students Interscholastic Athletics. First reading, Mr. Anderson will be presenting. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Mabry can attest, over the last five or six years, there's been a real push uh, by the board, especially Mr. Mabry, to increase our esports programs and opportunities uh, for scholarships and advancement uh, uh, and secondary or post-secondary uh, education for our kids. And just a month ago, uh, the team from Southridge was presented to you as not only state placers but also national placers. As we looked at expanding the games that uh, our students were playing and competing in, we noticed that in policy uh, 3550, uh, it talks about WIAA sanctioned uh, activities such as they do sanction esports, and they've only got four games that they sanction. And we would like to expand that and in order to expand it, we need to uh, add the verbiage that you see here. Esports may operate independent of WIA requirements. Esports activities and events shall follow the rules and regulations of the district. Games used in esports must receive approval from the executive director of uh, information and technology, Mr. Cohn, for now, and also our superintendent or designee. As you see, the sentence right above that talks about uh, the activities shall follow the rules and regulations of the WIAA. Now, in order to do this, we want to also keep a lid on it. We don't want games of mass destruction and shooting and those types of things, but we do want to open up uh, the opportunities for our kids to compete nationally and also compete for scholarships. So that's why we're asking the board today to look at an amendment to our existing policy. Yes, Kay. I just add one thing. I think this this policy amendment would reflect our current practice. Yes. So you said that you don't want games of mass destruction, or that, right? So where where does this? I that's mean, where, just, yeah. where does it say that, or where is the provision? Well, it it, that, it, it says here that that esports activities events shall follow the rules and regulations. Uh, and then it says here that, that any games used in esports must receive approval from uh, uh, IT because they're the ones that, they, so, that have gone in, looked at the games, and also from so, so, superintendent. So Ron Cones, Ron Cones kind of like, yes, no, yes, no, mass well, destruction. Well, and the superintendent designee, oh. which would be myself okay. or Dr. Pierce. Yeah. So, so Mr. Cohen's really looking at um, things from a technological perspective and sometimes games have different weird 
portals that open up to things that we don't want students accessing yeah. and those kinds sure. of things or or have open up our network to um, hacking. hacking or something. So he's looking at it from there along with Jack looking at it from its appropriateness and so forth. As a matter of fact, he's the one that found that yeah. that in order to access some of the WIAA games that they've got posted, it takes you to a board which then now accesses games that we could not access using our system and our filters. Yeah, and so there's more than just mass destruction, right? There's like borderline pornographic stuff sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And so Shooting, it, yeah. But it, I'm saying like, yes, there's death and that thing, but there's also the others, the moral, the morality stuff. And I just, and that's a, that's very important to me. That's yeah. a, it's important to us, so right. everybody. So Jack, maybe, and I'm thinking, in, you know, some of the games that they're playing now, it's like Mario Kart. Yeah. Mario Kart so, is but not. But Mario Kart's not that's, WIA that's a great game, approved, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, de de Mario Kart is not WIA approved. However, that's the one that our kids compete in. Yeah. And uh, we just need to have the policy reflect our, like Dr. Pierce said, our current practice. Okay. There's going to be checks and balances on this, and there already is. We're going to come after you, Jack, if we see some stuff from the video games. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't want to open Pandora's box right. no. at all. So, so just to understand, the, the eSports follows WIAA rules and regulations and all that stuff. However, this amendment just allows us to bring in a few, some additional games that they can play. Right, and that's what we're we're currently after. Okay. Jack, can you can you cover the monitoring that this is also monitored? I mean, this the the way that we find violations that someone is uh, I don't know if it's Ron Cone, but we do have oversight. On these well, we do, and we have we have uh, advisors mm -hmm. who right. also pick the games right. that the kids can access. Now, that doesn't keep a kid from. Sure trying to get around it, but we're still going to have firewalls and, and IT blocks in order to keep that from happening. Uh, so yeah, there, there's oversight at the school level, oversight at the IT level, and then game approval at, at the cabinet level. Wonderful, do you guys have any other comments, questions? Okay, I would entertain a motion. <clears throat> I'll make a motion that we accept <coughs> policy 3550 for additional gains uh, in our e sports program. I'll second. First and second. Any further comments, questions? Hearing none, I'll call for the roll call vote, please. Was that for first and second reading? First and second reading. Okay. Good catch. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're on to the next meeting agenda. Uh, so far, we have the 2023 preliminary budget. We have K-12 attendance and disciplinary rates, K-12 student survey data, and world language adoption. Anything else we'd like to see on the next meeting agenda? Hearing none, say we got a nice agenda for the next one. Okay, so next we are going to uh, adjourn into executive session. It should take roughly how long? 30 minutes roughly, for exec session. Roughly 30 minutes for executive session, at which point I will return and adjourn the meeting. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us.